Well, if you have your Bibles with you, and I hope that you do, uh, I would like for you to turn with me to the Old Testament in Psalm chapter 16. Psalm chapter 16 is where we'll study together tonight, and we'll study through the entirety of the psalm in verses 1 through 11. David, the king of Israel, writes this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit so that the words that we read are God's very words breathed out to us. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones, in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion in my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel, and the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices, my flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Amen. Well, let's pray together as we dive in. Our God and our Father, your word is life. And by it we are led into life. Your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Your word is truth, and by it we are made new. And so this evening, Lord, I pray that your word would fall upon each and every one of us to refresh us, to revive us, to call us into life. I pray that your Holy Spirit would come and cause your word to fall with power upon us so that our lives would be transformed by the good news that it reveals. For we pray and ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, one of the clearest and most evident realities when we look both into the Bible and when we look at our own lives is the reality of life's troubles. A trouble, one author has described it, seems to invade every nook and every cranny of our human existence each and every day. Troubles and hardships of different degrees bombard us, and they form this wearying mosaic of suffering. I think it's safe for me to say, without knowing many of you in this room, that there is some kind of trouble in your life right now. It's what characterizes our life in a Genesis 3 kind of world. Some kind of difficulty, some kind of disappointment characterizes your life perhaps today. We experience the, the little disappointments of life, don't we? When the items on our to-do list multiply despite our best efforts to overcome them. And perhaps you struggle with financial problems. You drive around in a car that has tires that are worn or brakes that are fading and you know you don't have the money to replace them. And maybe you're a new parent and you've got a little one who is crying at three o'clock in the morning and your sleep has now been interrupted for three nights in a row. And those are little troubles in life. But then there are the, the life-altering troubles. You find that your company has downsized and you're now out of a job. A friend or a family member of yours has been diagnosed with terminal cancer. Your adult son has rejected the Christian faith that you sought to instill in him. And the question that I want you and I to wrestle with as we turn to the Bible tonight is what carries us through life amidst such troubles? Where can we turn for true and enduring happiness when even the best moments of gladness and joy in life always seem to fade away? I want to submit to you that when life's troubles threaten to erode your joy and your confidence in God, that you and I would learn to sing what David sings 
and to pray what David prays here in Psalm 16. It's the most glorious Psalm of David that we are considering together this evening. It teaches us that everlasting joy and unshakable security in life can only be found when we set our gaze fully upon the Lord. It's when we keep our eyes upon him, fixing our hearts in the truth of who he is that that we can walk through this troubled life singing with David, I shall not be shaken. Oh, there are many things that can shake us in life, aren't there? And there were many things that would have shaken David in his own life. Remember David, the shepherd boy. Remember David, the the youngest son of Jesse, the one who uh, fought with the Philistine giant, Goliath, the one whose life was threatened by King Saul and who was conspired against by his own son, Absalom. Remember David, the greatest king that Israel had ever known and yet who sinned heinously against Bathsheba and her husband, Uriah. David was a man who was in many ways larger than life when we think about the Old Testament, and yet we know from our studies in First and Second Samuel that he was a deeply, deeply flawed man. He was a sinful man. And what we learn from this psalm is that he was a man who feared the future. He was a man who feared death and dying. He was a man who feared that God would abandon him. Trouble, we could say, seemed to follow David all throughout his life. And it's with some of those troubles in mind, we we don't know the specific troubles that David was dealing with, but but perhaps it's, it's some of those troubles that David is thinking about when he pens what he pens here in Psalm chapter 16. He writes this poetic song and this prayer where he essentially pours out his heart to God, confessing his confident trust in him alone. If you're using the the English Standard Version like me tonight, you'll see just before verse one, the description of this psalm that reads, a mictum of David. I'm sure you haven't used the term mictum with anybody this past week, but a mictum It's likely a liturgical term, and it's led many to believe that this was not only read by the people of God, but it was sung. It was the song of David, the song of Israel, and as we'll come to see, it is also the song of Jesus and all of those who would put their faith in him. David begins this psalm by crying out to God in prayer, saying, preserve me, O God, For in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. What we pick up in these first couple of verses is the truth that that you and I must seek refuge in the Lord and in his people. We seek refuge in our God and we delight in those who know him. The prayer begins with a a plea from David that God would preserve him. It's a cry where David is essentially saying, keep me, O God, keep me, protect me, guard me, do not let me fall away from you. The word preserve there is the same Hebrew word that is used in Psalm 121 in verses 7 and 8, where the psalmist says that the Lord will, will keep your life. A keeping, preserving, it's, it's the same idea. But he continues to say that he will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Uh, one of the things that I love about the Psalms, among many things, is their clear and evident honesty when it comes to the struggles of life and how the writers of the Psalms wrestle with God in prayer in light of those struggles. That's why the the Psalter is such a great help to us in in shaping our prayers and and helping us to think through how we can bring our troubles and our uh, anxieties before God. This introduction to David's prayer is raw and it's honest about his struggles in crying out to God for his protection. 
And it informs you and I that sometimes the most appropriate prayers that we can pray are not the prayers where we have premeditated over every thought that we're about to say, but it's the kind of prayers where we simply go before God and we say, help me, God, help me. I cannot do this. Help me, God, keep me. You know, David here is praying as a desperate man. And it's in that place of desperation where David is discovering the truth that that you and I have to learn time and time again that we never truly realize that God is all we need until we come to the realization that God is truly all we have. And so David runs to God seeking safety, not in what God can provide for him, but in who his God is for him. He is my refuge. He is the one in whom I find safety and security. I run to this God for safety. And this introduction, it's really a picture of trust in God. As if to say, amidst all of the uncertainties of David's life that he was facing, there is this acknowledgement in this prayer that instead of living by what he can physically see in his circumstances, Or instead of living by what he internally feels on the inside, David, by grace, is going to choose to live by who his God is and what his God has said. Oh, Jerry Bridges once helpfully defined for us trusting God, not as a passive state, but as a vigorous act of the soul by which we choose to lay hold of the promises of God and cling to them despite the adversity that at times seeks to overwhelm us. David here is clinging to his God. He is fighting the fight of faith to trust in God. And so he says to him, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. Out of all of the things that David could look to in his life and, and say, oh, this is good, whether it be his great wealth or his status as the king or his many, many accolades, none of those good things compared with this highest good in his life, knowing God himself. God is the great treasure. God is the ultimate good. God is the source of all things bright and beautiful. David sought refuge in the Lord and he found delight in God's people. The saints that David mentions in verse three, they are the ones he calls excellent, the excellent ones, the holy ones, uh, the ones who walk in God's ways. And the truth that we see here is that when our hearts have been transformed by God in his grace to know him as our highest good, then we in turn grow in this increasing love and affection for the people who know him. That's why as we think about one another here at Parkside, we should hold one another in such high esteem, such high regard as we come to know one another intimately that we think to ourselves, all those brothers and sisters in Christ at Parkside, they are some of the dearest people and some of the dearest Christians that I know. The reason I cherish our church family in part is because I cherish not only the fellowship that we have in the Lord Jesus, but the fellowship that we share with one another. We can look around at each other and say, oh, you are the excellent ones. But notice here with me the juxtaposition between those people who are the excellent ones, who love and know God in verse three, and those who run after other gods in verse four. David says that the sorrows of those who run after another little g God shall multiply, they'll increase. And their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names upon my lips. You see, there was no refuge to be found in the pagan deity of David's day. Regardless of how appealing or alluring they may have been, whether it was the the Baals or the Astaroths. And listen, friends, there is no refuge to be found in any God we might construct for ourselves and look to put our trust in today. Oh, listen, you might not be tempted to worship some kind of figure, but if you make the highest good in your life your money, 
The promise of this verse is that it will ultimately lead to increasing sorrows. If you make your highest good, your God in your life, your children or your family or your spouse, it will only leave you empty. If you make the object of your worship and affection in life, your reputation or what other people think about you, the promise of this verse is that it will ultimately come crashing down in the end. There is no refuge to be found in those things, but there is only refuge and security in the Lord. He is the one who provides security and lasting safety amidst life's troubles. And not only do we need to seek him as our refuge, but David tells us in verses five through eight that we must set the Lord always before ourselves. We have to rehearse and remind ourselves often of all that our God is for us. And look what David says in verse five. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel, and the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me, and because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. You know, it's a good and right thing for us to ask ourselves often, what is it that I am setting before myself each and every day. When you wake up in the middle of the night or when you get out of bed in the morning before your feet have even touched the ground, it is good and right for you to ask yourself, what is it that I'm giving my heart and my mind over to? If you're anything like me, there are times where you have to shamefully confess that what you are setting before yourself, what is at your right hand is actually not the Lord himself, but, but it's, it's things like this. It's things like a cell phone. And upon that phone, what we find are those many, many apps that can show us things like, like our bank accounts and our retirement statements. And in some ways, our hearts begins to take refuge in that reality. And we go into our phones and we find things like, like photos that display before others this idea that we have meaning, that we have some kind of identity in the fact that others see us and know us. We look into our emails and our, our many, many agenda items and we think to ourselves, well, this is what gives me purpose. This is what I trust in. And so often what we set before ourselves and we cultivate in our hearts are the troubles of this world are the troubles of our lives, our pain, our past, our unfavorable and undesirable circumstances. And so we ask ourselves, is it any wonder that so many today live lives that are deeply, deeply shaken and undone by the troubles of life? And before we know it, what is looming larger than anything in our hearts and in our lives is not the truth of God's word, but it's news story after news story after news story. And it's our social media feeds that we continue to scroll and to scroll and to scroll through. Instead of setting before ourselves this unshakable truth of Christ who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, what begins to weigh upon us is the reality of our problems. And we turn to those numbing effects of endless entertainment that we find upon our television screens. I love the way that George Mueller once said it when he wrote that the first great and primary business to which I ought to attend to every day is to have my soul happy in God. The first thing to be concerned about is not how I might serve God or how I might glorify God, but how I might get my soul into a happy state. You see, the, the first primary business that we ought to attend to each and every day is to get our souls happy in God. It's a cultivation of an awareness of God, that we live our life before God and in God. We, we live and we move in our, and we find our being in Him. We have to remind ourselves of God's character and His attributes 
as we soak him into our souls, just like a, a sponge as it is immersed down into water. And so David here in verses five through eight, we could say is rehearsing to himself the character of God. I doubt that these were new insights for David, but these were truths that he desperately needed to hear again and again and again and again. And so he tells himself, God is my portion, meaning that regardless of how much wealth I have acquired in my life, God is my great wealth and he is my ultimate blessing. God is my cup, meaning that regardless of how satisfied I might be in a job or in things or with people, ultimately my satisfaction comes from him. Well, David's lot in life the lines that marked out what God had provided for him is both pleasant and beautiful. And this is God's grace that is undeserved and yet has been freely given. Now, at first glance at the text, you might think to yourself, well, surely this must be a reference to those divided portions of the land in Israel. And David must be referring to the physical boundary markers set between the tribes. But I want you to take note that what David is doing here in the language that he's using, it's Levitical language. It comes from the priestly line of, of Aaron. And the Lord spoke to Aaron in Numbers chapter 18 and verse 20, saying, you shall have no inheritance in their land, neither shall you have any portion among them. But I am your portion and your inheritance among the people of Israel. So catch what David's doing here. Don't miss it. He's saying that, that this is not about material wealth. This is not about physical land. But the greatest treasure and the greatest gift that God has ever given to me is the gift of himself. He is the fountain of all goodness. He is the greatest of all delights. He is the glorious one and he is mine. Oh, you know, the most important thing about your life tonight, if you are a Christian, it is not the car that you drive. It is not the job that you work. It is not the family that you have. It is none of those things. But the most important thing and the truest thing about you is that regardless of your circumstances, because you have looked to that refuge that is Jesus Christ and your life is hidden in him, Oh, you can say, the lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a beautiful inheritance because one day I am going to see the Lord completely and fully as he is and I will be made like him. That's what's coming for you. Oh, one commentator has said of this, that to gain him is to gain the one who made and controls all things the inventor of every pleasure, the insurer of all security, the definer of right and wrong, and the rewarder of those who seek him. To lose him, even if you gain the whole world in exchange, would be to lose everything. So see what David is doing here. He's saying God is everything to me in this moment. God is my portion. God is my cup. He is my lot. He is my inheritance. And, and not only that, but, but David says in verse 7, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. And the night also my heart instructs me. In the middle of the night when David's mind wandered and his heart was restless and riddled with anxieties, it was the Lord he sought for counsel. And in those same restless nights, when you and I toss and we turn in our beds, and we are riddled with fear and anxieties and troubles, the one we ought to seek out is not a spouse. It is not a best friend. It is not what is on our phones, but it is the God of the Bible, the one who guides and who keeps. That's why Isaiah said in Isaiah 26, verse 3, that you keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed upon you because he trusts in you. Oh, God is a present help in the day of trouble who can be trusted. And in him, regardless of what is going on in your life, 
Regardless of the particular circumstances that you find yourself in, you can say with David, I shall not be shaken. David sought the Lord as his refuge. He set the Lord always before himself. And thirdly and finally, what we can learn from this psalm in verses 9 through 11 is that we must hold to our future hope where there are pleasures forevermore. David says that because of the truth that he has just unpacked for us in verses 1 through 8, that now in verse 9, therefore, my heart is glad. So David has moved from the pressures and the troubles of life in verse 1 to now delighting in God. Nothing about his circumstances have changed, but his disposition, his heart has changed so much so that he can now say, my whole being rejoices and my flesh dwells secure, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life, and in your presence there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Oh, David could walk through life with gladness in his heart, not because he knew how everything was going to play out in his life, not because God made him some promise that he would always prosper or that he would never suffer and that he would never see death. Certainly we know that David would. But David could rest glad and content in his life because, come whatever may, the Lord was at his right hand as his portion, as his guide, as his refuge, as his life. He is my all and my all. And I wonder, as we think about our lives tonight, could the same be said about you and me? Do you know the Lord as your refuge? your portion, your all in all. It's interesting here that in the original language, the phrase in verse nine, my flesh also dwells secure, it's also been rendered by some that my flesh shall rest in hope. So see that security and hope could be used here simultaneously. Now, typically in the 21st century, we don't talk about security and hope in the same ways, do we? And when we think about security, we think about something that is fixed, it is certain, it is guaranteed. But hope is something of a desired expectation. We speak of hope in the similar ways that we, we speak of a wish. We say, I, I wish you well. I hope you're doing well. I'm hoping for that promotion. I, I wish there was a cure. But biblical hope it is far different than a wish. The kind of hope and security that David is describing here and is uh, putting his, his confident hope in is this assurance in the rock solid security of who his God is and what his God has promised to do and to be for his people. And so he can say, you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. A shield being that place of utter darkness and death where it would seem as if all hope is lost. David says, my God will never forsake me. I have hope even in the face of death because I know security in the fortress that is my God. And so you ask yourself, how could David say such a thing? How could anybody say such a thing? Is there anything so guaranteed, so certain, that we could look to it both in life and in death? Well, if you're somebody who likes to underline and you like to highlight in your Bible, I do, I use a blue pen when I go through my Bible reading. But if, if you like to highlight, verse 10 is one to draw your attention to every single time you look at this psalm. David says, you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. In making this claim, I believe that David here is, is looking in, in two different directions. 
Uh, He's looking backward upon a a covenant promise that God has made with him, and he's looking forward to the fulfillment of that promise that will come from his own line. He's looking backward upon a covenant that God made with him. We know well, 2 Samuel chapter 7, where the Lord said, when your days are fulfilled, David, and you go to lie down with your fathers, I will raise up from your offspring after you one who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. And so David is looking back upon a promise, and he's looking far into the future into a uh, son of David who is still yet to come. And as prominent And as renowned as David's rule was in Israel for 40 years, there was a greater king to come with a greater kingdom that would endure and last forever. Oh, you know, David could not see all that you and I can see. But David had a promise from the Lord. And if you'll turn with me to the New Testament in the book of Acts, and go to Acts chapter 2, We'll see the ways in which the New Testament writers interpreted these verses. The Apostle Peter, as well as the Apostle Paul, both reference these verses in Psalm 16, in both Acts chapter 2 and in Acts 13. Uh, But this is what Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost, uh, when the Spirit gives power to those early disciples to go and bear witness in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Peter preaches and 3,000 souls are saved and he references these verses. So look with me at verse 25, Acts chapter two. For David says concerning him, him, Jesus, I saw the Lord always before me For he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh will also dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn of his descendants on his throne, take note of this this next phrase, David foresaw and he spoke about the resurrection of the Christ. That he, Jesus, was not abandoned to Hades nor did his, Jesus' flesh, see corruption. And of this Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. So you see, Psalm 16 is not just a song of King David, but Psalm 16 is a song of King Jesus. This is an Easter song. This is a resurrection song. David foresaw and he looked forward in these verses to the greater son of David, the Lord Jesus. And although David would die and decay in the tomb, and although you and I may die and decay in the tomb, we like David can rest secure in hope because God has made a covenant with his people. He has pledged himself to be faithful and he has demonstrated that in Christ the King, the Holy One, who would never be left in the grave. Oh, Jesus died in the place of sinners at the cross and he was buried in a tomb, but he rose triumphant on a Sunday. Jesus was resurrected and vindicated as that greater son of David, as the King who dies to rescue and to ransom a people for himself. And so now in Jesus, we can know forgiveness of our sins. Now in Jesus, we can know the path of life. Now in Jesus, we can know the fullness of joy that salvation in him brings if we have trusted in him by faith alone. We come to this king bringing nothing. We bring our sin and and we come with those empty hands and he gives us everything. Oh, friends, if you want to know unshakable security and you want to know everlasting joy in this troubled life, do not look for it 
in the things the world tells you to. The world says look for it in money and in sex and in worldly pleasures and in status. But don't go there. Don't run for it in people or in places or in circumstances or deep down within yourself. Don't run after other gods, but but run and find refuge in the Lord Jesus alone. Because all of the security and all of the pleasure that you and I long for will never be found in what God can give to us, but in who God in Jesus is for us. And it's why Jesus said in John 10.10, I came into this world that they would know life and they would know it abundantly. Oh, if you're looking for the abundant life tonight, if you want to know the maximum level of joy and pleasures that will never end, then you look beyond the fleeting and the passing cheap pleasures of this world and you let your eyes run to Jesus who is resurrected and who is ascended and who is reigning at the right hand of the Father and whom are pleasures forevermore. We look to that future hope, to that culmination of our hope even as we have tasted it in part in the here and now. We walk as sojourners and strangers, as Christians in the path of life, even as we face life's troubles. Even as we die, and we know death and decay in a tomb, the promise of Psalm 16 is that we will be kept in joy by the faithful King who is our refuge. And so we set the Lord Jesus before us, and we never take our eyes away from Him And because he is there at our right hand, regardless of what is going on in this shaken world, we can say in him, I will not be shaken. Let's pray together. Our Father, what a thought that you would open our eyes to behold this path of life. What a marvelous thought that you would call us out of our idle chasing pursuits and running after other gods and you would show us that in your presence there is fullness of joy and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Father, we thank you that each and every day we can choose to say by your grace that I will set the Lord before me. Lord, help us to live unshaken in a world that is deeply shaken. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.